In order to understand why light has become an object of worship by the Masons and others, one has to understand some simple laws of the physical universe. It is obvious that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. The Masons know that it is in the direction known as the east where the physical sun rises each day. Mr. Pike indicated that it is in the eastern part of their lodge that their worshipful master, their equivalent of the president, sits. One Mason who explained this fact was Captain William Morgan, a Mason of some 30 years, who exposed the Masonic rituals in a book entitled, Freemasonry Exposed. According to him, the master sits in the east for a reason. As the sun rises in the east to open and adorn the day, so presides the worshipful master in the east to open and adorn his lodge. Albert Pike further discussed that point when he wrote. Our lodges are said to be due east and west, because the master represents the rising sun, and of course must be in the east. Mr. Mackey also wrote about the relationship of the place of the master's location and the east. The east, being the place where the master sits, is considered the most honorable part of the lodge. So the sun, a symbol of Lucifer, the god of some of the masons, resides in the east. The masons know this, so they place their worshipful master in that area and then conceal the reasons why they have done so from their fellow masons. The significance of this fact will become clear in this video. The Masons have agreed with the Egyptians that Osiris, one of their gods, was a deity. For instance, Albert Mackey wrote Rule, Osiris was the sun. Sun gods all over the world have had temples erected to their memory and is a place where they might be worshipped. Osiris was no exception. The Masons are aware of this penchant for temple building as a place for god worship. In October 1953, a Mason wrote the following in the New Age magazine, the magazine published by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. If perchance you were to visit the Great Pyramid of Giza, also spelled Giza, you would be presented with a souvenir, stating that Osiris commanded Thams to build him a house in the form of a pyramid with certain designated passageways. Some in Egypt claim that the Great Pyramid was not built as a tomb for a deceased pharaoh, but as a temple for initiation into sun worship. There is now a growing body of evidence to support that claim. But, it is important to set the stage for that conclusion first by examining that evidence. The author would like to make a few comments at this juncture. It is not my purpose to convince the reader that these comments about the purpose of the pyramid are correct. I am only attempting to convince you that these sun worshippers consider them to be true. And, because they do, they are making plans for our future. And those plans should concern each reader of this material, because, as I am attempting to point out, the overall changes they are arranging are going to alter the very way all of us live our lives. And, I for one, do not care for the plans being made. There are some who claim that the pyramid was constructed about 6,000 years ago, and not about 3,000 years ago as most archaeologists believe. One who makes that claim is Richard W. Noon, in his book entitled, 552000. Mr. Noon's book is not about pyramids as such, but about his claims that massive changes will occur on the Earth on that date, in the year 2000, due to a change in the alignment of five planets near to the Earth. This will not be the place to comment on his charges. However, he has done considerable research into the pyramids as part of his studies. He has pointed out that the word for pyramid in ancient Egypt was glorious light, once again connecting the pyramid with the sun and the sun god Osiris. Manley P. Hall stated that he too believed that the pyramid was constructed for some purpose, other than for the burial of a pharaoh. He wrote. The pyramids, the great Egyptian temples of initiation. He also wrote that he knew what the initiation ceremony was for. The Illumined of Antiquity entered its portals as men, they came forth as gods. There are many now who believe that an individual named Khufu built the Great Pyramid. The name, according to Mr. Noon, is phonetically similar to the ancient Egyptian word for the Great Pyramid, Kuti, meaning glorious light. Some writers on the pyramid have indicated that their research has led them to the conclusion that the pyramid has a concealed timetable built into its passageways. Max Toth is one of these authors, and he has written this in his book entitled, Pyramid Prophecies. The prophecies of the ancient masters are located into the pyramid form. It is the opinion of Mr. Noon that there is only one prophecy that should be examined, and it is this one. Beginning at the geometrical point beneath the pyramid eris edge, defined as two straight lines coming together at an angle, meets the projected floor line of the ascending passage, we have a straight line that runs up the ascending passage and grand gallery. This line measured 6,000 inches. For those not familiar with these terms, the pyramid is entered through a passageway called the descending passageway. This meets with a passageway, going up into the pyramid, called, obviously, the ascending passage, at the end of which are several rooms. So, here the author is describing a line down the grand gallery, through the ground under the pyramid, where it meets with a line coming down the outside of the pyramid. The line, from the point where these two lines meet, back up the inside line, and where it meets the rooms at the top of the passageway, measures 6,000 inches. 
The significance of this measurement will be explained later. The important thing to notice here is that this 6000 inch line is truly hidden. It does not exist in reality. It is hidden underground with no apparent existence. It is truly a hidden prediction. Joseph Carr, a writer on the Nazi party of Adolf Hitler and its connections with sun worship, wrote about an experience an individual had inside the pyramid. In April, 1904 an English Buddhist named Aleister Crowley visited Cairo. Rose Edith Crowley, his wife, asked her husband to perform a magical ritual. He obeyed by saying the prayer of invocation to Horus, another Egyptian sun god. He later claimed that a being appeared to him during that hour, and announced to him that the old age was passing away, and a new age was dawning. Also revealed to Crowley was that the religion of the new age could not take its place until the old religion was smashed. So, here we see a connection between the pyramid, sun worship and the new age. One of the proofs that the pyramid was not constructed as a burial chamber is the fact that both of the two large rooms inside the pyramid, the so-called king's chamber and the queen's chamber, have vent ducts leading from inside the rooms to the outside of the pyramid. This had led many to believe that the ducts were meant to provide air for human occupants. Some of these writers have expressed their opinions in the books that they have written. One of these is Wilfred Gregson, an architect and a 33rd degree mason, who wrote this. Obviously the idea was to get air moving into the pyramid. You can't exist very long breathing stagnant air. So my principle is that this was a temple of initiation. Manley P. Hall, a fellow mason, agreed with Mr. Gregson when he wrote this comment. There seems to be no reason why a legitimate tomb should have air vents going from the king's chamber as well as the queen's chamber out to the surface. Another writer on the pyramid, Andre Pachin, has written in his book The Mysteries of the Great Pyramid. If the two conduits were originally ventilation ducts, the unavoidable conclusion is that the Great Pyramid's upper chamber was not the site of the Royal Sepulchre. Continuous ventilation would have inevitably resulted in not only the putrefaction of the mummy, but also the rapid destruction of all the funerary furniture, indispensable to the deceased for his life to the beyond. Mr. Noon connected the Great Pyramid in Egypt with the symbolism of the pyramid in Mexico, called the Pyramid at Chichen Itza. The temple at the east of the quadrangle has a great many repeats of a huge sunburst, from the middle of the sunburst is the huge head of a serpent whose mouth is open. This needs little explanation. The sun representing God and the serpent his divine wisdom holds man's head so that he can neither see the serpent divine wisdom nor the light of God from which it comes. Mr. Noon is saying that the serpent is attempting to keep man from understanding that the God was Lucifer in the form of a sunburst. But there is another mystery concealed inside the Great Pyramid that must be explored. The pyramid appears to have been built to memorialize the explosion of the great star 4,000 years ago. Mr. Noon says. If the ascending passage and grand gallery were built to observe this supernova explosion, the Giza complex was built to memorialize a tremendous cataclysm in the Earth's planetary system, which affected the Earth with fire and flood. The grand gallery, aimed like a giant telescope at a particular celestial body in the Earth's southern sky, before its view of the heavens was blocked by the completion of the building points to where radio astronomy has just pinpointed the supernova, or giant stellar explosion. The Great Pyramid's Grand Gallery is focused at this particular spot in the Earth's southern sky. Then Mr. Noon discussed the research being done to locate the spot in the universe where the Grand Gallery is pointed. He wrote. In the late 1960s, Dr. Anthony Hewish, 1974 co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics, was working at England's Mullard Radio Astronomy Observatory. Hewish began to track a mysterious rhythmic series of pulses, clearly from a point in the Earth's southern sky. Mr. Noon pointed out that Dr. Hewish demonstrated that the strange rhythmic pulses were radio emissions from a star that had collapsed or blown itself up in the Earth's southern sky sometime around 4000 BC, a date memorialized in the mysteries of Freemasonry as Analusis, the Year of Light. In another part of the world, George Michinowski, author of the book entitled The Once and Future Star, was deciphering an incredible message cut, carved, and indented in an ancient cuneiform, meaning a language of wedge-shaped characters used in ancient inscriptions, clay tablet, located in the British Museum. The ancient Sumerian cuneiform table Michinowski was deciphering, described a giant star exploding within a triangle, formed by the three stars, Zeta Puppis, Gamma Velarum, and Lambda Velarum. These three stars are located in the Earth's southern sky, and unknown to Michinowski at the time were being tracked by Anthony Hewish. Michinowski continued deciphering the Sumerian star catalog, containing observations going back thousands of years. The remarkably accurate star catalog now stated that the blazing star that had exploded within the triangle would again be seen by man in 6,000 years. So two world-renowned scientists had independently discovered the results of a large explosion that they both felt had occurred around 6,000 years ago. Mr. Noon then asked the question. Is there a Masonic connection between Vela X, a star, which exploded within a triangle, and the ancient religious symbolism and star dates of Freemasonry? And the Masons have answered it with a positive yes. 
Albert Mackey, the Mason, in his encyclopedia, wrote this. In the year of light, abbreviated AL. The date used in ancient craft masonry, found by adding 4000 to the vulgar era, meaning the common era, thus, 1911 plus 4000 equals 5911. This current book was being written in 1989 AD, which stands for Anno Domini, the year of the Lord, meaning since the birth of Jesus. But according to the Masons, the true calendar date should be written 5989 AL. Another writer on the Great Pyramid is Tom Valentine, and his book is entitled, The Great Pyramid. Man's Monument to Man. Mr. Valentine wrote. The Great Pyramid System of Passages and Chambers is a chronological graph that begins in 4000 BC and continues for 6000 years. So, according to the Masons, there are only 11 years to the year 6000. But what happens after the 6000 years? What is next? The New Agers have told us. Marilyn Ferguson, a New Age believer, has written a book entitled, The Aquarian Conspiracy, in which she wrote the following. We are entering a millennium of love and light. A millennium is defined as a thousand-year period. So, it appears that sometime in the near future, the New Agers are going to see the beginning of the millennium reign of Lord Maitreya. This position was confirmed by the Lucis Trust, also a New Age organization, when it wrote the following in a quarterly newsletter for the third quarter, 1982. The year 2020 looms before humanity as a gigantic milestone which marks both an ending and a beginning. It marks the end of a volatile millennium which has seen enormous progress and change. But more importantly, the year 2020 stands as a symbolic portal through which humanity can pass into a new age, if it so chooses. So something is coming. And it is coming by the year 2020. And it is called the new age. Or the new world order. This was everything inside me channel. Please like, drop a comment, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the notification bell too. Thanks for watching till the end. Stay safe and healthy.